Just let me know when you're ready. Ready? All right. Call a meeting of North Reading School Committee to order. I have complete confidence that we will do all the people's business tonight in 75 minutes or less. You can guess why. Um, I hope so. I hope so. First order of business is public input. Do we have anybody who wishes to be heard? Mr. Yule, state your name and address and be heard. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi, Jeff. My name is Jeff Yule, 427 uh, Park Street here in North Reading. Uh, interesting setup that you have here. Next time I've been here, I think we should be when you over at the uh, middle school. It's like those old movies where someone's sitting at this end of the table oh, right. and someone's sitting at that end of the table. <laughs> yes. The old and the young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, but the reason why I'm here is, um, um, first of all, uh, let me say uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members, uh, Superintendent Willis, Mr. Connolly, welcome to our town. Thank you. Um, but I'm here to thank you and share with the community uh, the positive impact the school committee has on the future of the children of the North Reading School District. In America, if one commits a crime, they go through a process of being tried, convicted, then sentenced. Justice, justice prevails, and uh, however, someone will, will be still wrongly done. There is no consolation for the victim or for a grieving family. When a child does not receive the necessary education of their time, upon arrival to, to adulthood, they are left for dead. Because they lack the required tools of the day, there is no consolation to the new adult who can't get a good job because they have nothing to offer. They become vulnerable to the economic freefall they can't stop. This analogy paints a picture of how important what you do in this room really is to the future of those under your care. Today's youth rely on the decisions you make. You impact their future. As parents, we have our part in this as well. But this is about education and the, the valuable role you play in the big picture of a child's life. You play a key role in the status of our country. You affect the makeup of the job market. You determine the employment rate. You determine the direction America will go based on the knowledge you pass on to our children. You determine the strength of the United States. You determine how free and self-reliant the youth of America will be. This is a huge burden, but knowing you as I do, you accept it gladly along with the criticism. Please indulge me just a little more. Uh, my two children, now aspiring young adults, began their public education under the tutelage of educators chosen by the school committee, starting with Dr. Troughton and now Superintendent Kathleen Willis, along with then <coughs> business manager Carl Nelson and now Mr. Connolly. Along with them, uh, through them, you selected principals with vision. And through those principals, teachers like Mrs. McBride, who not only set the first block to their foundation of knowledge, but created an environment so positive that their travels through the school years were, went unimpeded. To Ms. Fleck and Mrs. Vincent, who strengthened, strengthened their learning skills and Ms. Vincent is retired. Through, uh, through positive reinforcement, in middle school, Ms. Fisher and Mrs. Zager, who as disciplinarians helped them understand that listening is the key to learning. In high school, Mrs. Kane and Mr. Putnam, who inspired them to reach higher than ever by always demanding that they do the best they can at all times. These educators, along with the entire teaching staff, provided the energy and passion to educate the children of North Reading as best they could. Retired Principal Lassis, who prepared the little school children for middle school by replica replicating the class structure to that of the middle school. Finally, Principal, uh, uh, finally, Principal Bernard, with his emphasis on AP courses. 
well prepared our young adults for college. In the case of my son, 13 uh, uh, North Reading High School AP credits were accepted by Ithaca College. And I'm sure he's not the only one. I'm sure there were other students that have had uh, uh, received that benefit. So all of this you have done throughout the years and will no doubt continue accordingly. So this is just a thank you because I'm obviously not a parent in the teach, you know, that's involved in your program uh, through my students. So I, I think, I don't believe that the school committee often enough gets the criticism, I mean the, you get the criticism, I should <laughs> say. <laughs> you don't get the credit for really what you, the tone that you set here. So I just thought I would take this opportunity, I've been wanting to do it for some time, but I want to take this opportunity to, to uh, thank you. Well, thanks, Jeff. So. I, I'd like to make a motion to let Jeff go on for about another half hour. <laughs> 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 and, then, and then at that time, to propose a uh, pay scale for the uh, school committee. <laughs> uh, well, again, our, our administrators, faculty, and staff do an incredible job, but it really starts at the top with the school committee. Um, and it works its way down from there. But well, they do a tremendous job. Really but things do it. trickle from top down. Yeah, no, but I, I do think. One, one thing is we, we have a very, um, this committee works well together. We have disagreements on many issues, but we don't sit here and, you know, throw bricks at each other at our meetings. We work things out. We, um, we take votes on all the issues we need to take votes on. And we do have a great staff, great administrators, great teachers. Um, and I think Ms. Willis and, and Michael Connolly coming in new, or just a great um, team at the top. Mm -hmm. And we have Mr. Daly here tonight also as our, um, I probably director. need to say, Director of Academic Academics Services. and Technology. Services. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I, his, his title's changed, so I can't. I, I do find that the more often we meet in this room, the acrimony seems to be building uh, <laughs> more and more <laughs> in the committee. So I, I don't know what the future will bring, but. Uh, Great. Anybody else have any comments? Uh, Cliff? I'd like to make a motion. Yes? Yeah, I'd like to double our salary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that tonight yeah. with no damage to the, uh, to the uh, budget. I don't think that was quite my purpose. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we double zero, though, we'll, we'll that's be true, okay. That's true. I, I, I did have another reason why I was here as well, and, and it ought, it'll only take a, f a few minutes. I have to throw on a different hat now. That it's, it's my transition. Mm -hmm. from, uh, from a parent with children in the school to someone who's involved, excuse me, involved in the community in, in, in different ways. Um, so I, before I spoke as a parent, and, and now I'm going to uh, speak uh, as, a, as the chairman for the North Reading Republican Town Committee. And uh, what I wanted to, you know, one of the things that I come to realize, I think I knew this a while ago, but I come to realize that college is expensive, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, at the gra last graduation, when I saw all of the uh, scholarships coming forward, I said, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really good idea. And so I'm going to pass out to you um, uh, a scholarship that's being started uh, December 1st. Yes. Thank you. It's being put on by the uh, Mass GOP. Okay. It's going to start December 1st. It's an essay that the students uh, anywhere between the ages of 13 and 17 may, Thank you, Jeff. may submit. The details are there, but it's a $1,000 scholarship plus three $500 scholarships. And uh, the idea, obviously, is to, uh, the, the essay is to be on why the Republican Party is the party of the future. And if someone believes that, they have an opportunity to write that and, and uh, uh, <coughs> submit it to the, uh, the mass GOP. Are you eligible to win if you just fake it? And <laughs> Who will I, know? I, I, I'm <laughs> Nobody will know, you know. Um, I wish they had it last year. But um, uh, so that, that's something that the uh, uh, Mass GOP is, is doing. Uh, Great. I'd like to, you know, 
I, I don't know the procedure. I don't know if I should, I'd like to have the high school. Mm -hmm. Since it's 13 to, to 17 years, it includes seniors, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but I'd like to have some flyers distributed to the students so that they can take advantage of it. It starts December, um, uh, no, November 1st, and it ends December uh, uh, f first. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Webster, yes, to the chair. If you bring these uh, flyers to the high school guidance department, they will make sure that they're added to the list that students um, need to uh, take a look at when they're applying for scholarships right. across, you know, okay, this okay. school year. And it's not just for seniors. I realize that it's for all students. Right. Right. Okay. So. Um, uh, but it's, it starts November 1st and ends Dece December 1st. So. Mm -hmm. um, now, to add to that, what, uh, as chairman for the North Reading Republican Town Committee, we're going to uh, piggyback this and come up with a different uh, essay. But uh, we're going to piggyback this so that we can have something for the students. And it, we're kind of working it out now. Uh, but it's probably going to be anywhere from 250 to 500 dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the money the Mass GOP has, <laughs> and uh, piggyback on something like that for uh, graduation, so students uh, will be more con concentrating more on seniors mm -hmm. uh, for that for that program. Great, and for that they'd work through you, through the guidance department at the high school. Okay, even for the new scholarship that they're yes. Okay. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks, so, Jeff. I just wanted to share that with I you. And, again, and thank you for all that you do, by the way. Thank you. you do a lot. Appreciate you coming in. This is due the November 1st? No, you said it's due December 1st. Due December 1st. It starts um, uh, November 1st. It says contest deadline is November 1. Yeah. I'm sorry? The contest deadline, deadline is November 1. No, it, it's actually December 1st. Okay. Okay. Did I give you? Because it should say, I, I probably printed the wrong one. It should say that uh, it's been extended to December. Oh, okay. 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 That's yeah, what it, it says should at say. a Christmas party in December. Yeah. Right. So it should be say it's ex extended to. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Glad your kids doing well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very, very happy. And I, again, I thank you for that. Great. Thanks for coming in. Take Appreciate care. it. Thank okay. you. Okay, next we have our student member tonight, we have Jackie Lanzaro. Jackie. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, for sports, boys soccer made it to states for the fourth consecutive year. They won 3-1 to one versus Pentucket at home on Saturday night, which was also their senior night. Girls soccer also qualified for states. Their senior night was today versus Triton, which they won 1-0. to zero. Field hockey did not qualify for states. However, their senior night was last Wednesday versus Pentucket. This game was also dedicated to Mr. Carlson. Volleyball qualified for states with their win over Hamilton Wenham Friday, which was also their senior night. Cross country went to Cal's this Saturday, and their top runner, Nikki Roberts, came in second place. For golf, sophomore Ryan Delaney made it to states and competed today in Barrington. The cheerleaders got first place in both of their invitationals over the past two weekends at Austin Prep and Ipswich. The football team beat the previously undefeated Pentucket on Friday. This game was dedicated to Mrs. Valenti. They will be playing this Friday at home versus Winthrop, next Friday versus Amesbury, and the Friday after that at home versus Weston. As fall sports have begun to conclude, it has also been announced that there will be no more sports award ceremonies. Each team is responsible for their own ceremony. Who announced that? Mr. Johnson, really? the athletic director. Hmm. Huh. Um, Masker's self-composed play titled Waves of Grace is being performed this Friday and Saturday at 7 o'clock. This play written by the students of Masker's and Mrs. Kane is also competing in the one-act competition. The student council officers attended officer shop last Monday at Holy Cross. This is the last week of the food drive. While the school has been doing a great job throughout the month, student council is expecting, the end, is expecting to end the drive on a very high note. Last Friday, a few delegates also visited the food pantry to drop off the food that has already been collected. This Sunday, five students are competing in the preliminary round of the high school quiz show, quiz show at WGBH. Interact is currently collecting coats throughout the winter months. 
Last Wednesday, a motivational speaker talked to both the freshman and sophomore classes. Senior Casey Berkowitz was recently recognized as a National Merit Scholar commended student, so congratulations. Also, another senior, <coughs> Matthew Layton, is a top 10 finalist for the USA Senate Scholarship. After an interview and writing an essay on spot, it will be decided if he will be one of the Massachusetts two delegates to visit Washington, D.C. for a week in March. The PSATs were two Saturdays ago. Last Saturday was the ACTs, and this Saturday is the SATs. And that's all. You taking the SATs? No. Not yet. Not yet. Huh. Any student, work. student work. Um, for my student work, you can pass this up. Thank you. Um, for Mr. Fantopoulos's World History II Honors class, we completed a project called the Age of Imperialism Project. Instead of reading out of the textbook about Chapter 11, which was based on the Age of New Imperialism, we were um, paired together and we each had a country and we had to make a PowerPoint describing the motives, actions, and results of new imperialism for that country. Um, my country was Portugal. And that is a copy of the PowerPoint me and my partner, Carrie Ann Donovan, made. Um, not only was this project helpful because it was a fun way to learn Chapter 11, we also were able to use and learn about Google Drive. And we were able to use the Chromebooks in the high school. And we also learned about how we can share documents that we make on Google Drive with not only other students, but our teacher as well. How do you like him as a teacher? <laughs> I, I like him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so now, see, I'm just looking. I did not know that Portugal was uh, the first of the great European global empires. Did you, you know that? You should, of course, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we even ask him? This is great, and it's a good way again learning the, the Google, learning to use Google Drive and the Chromebook. So, are those the new Chromebooks we? Received in that uh, donation recently. It is there in, in the model classroom. That's Did you, awesome. Was this in the model classroom? Yes. Where it took place. Great. Yes. Yeah, and those are really cool. I mean, they're so light and they're so small, but you can since you can access everything. Yeah, I really like them. Yeah. Nice. Uh. Any questions for Jackie? It's good to see you back. Thanks for all the good news on the sports front. Yeah. It's great. Have good. Have good uh, rest of the. 2013 school year. Thank you. And Kathy, I will ask you um, make a note that we would like, I would like to, and I'm sure Mrs. Nancy would like to discuss the information we heard tonight sure. regarding the sports awards at our next athletic session. Yes, yes, I had a meeting with Mr. Bernard um, earlier this afternoon. Okay. Comes as a surprise. Yes, comes as a surprise. Mm -hmm. Why does it come as a surprise? <laughs> no, we'll, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. All right, next we're gonna shift the agenda around a little bit. Of course, now I can't find my agenda. It is. And I think we're going to bring up the school trip uh, for the North Reading High School <coughs> Club to go to the Model United Nations. So whoever is presenting that, please come up. And also, congratulations to Casey Berkowitz. That's yes. quite a, quite congratulations an honor. Congratulations is right. Congratulations. So hi, my name is Soteros Gonzopoulos, uh, history teacher at North Reading High School, also the advisor to the model United Nations at the high school. I brought with me Jeremy Kohlberg Susi and Casey Berkowitz, two seniors that would like to go on this trip, scheduled for January 30th to, through February 2nd. I do have a pamphlet here, I believe. I think copies were made. If not, I can pass this around in a moment. I'm just going to read a few things from it. Um, main reason for going to this trip, just coming from an advisor's perspective, also a proud North Reading Public School uh, graduate. I went through the system, graduated 2001. We didn't have a model of the United Nations back then, international affairs, diplomacy is always something I was interested in. And I think it's a um, great thing that the school now has it. I've been the advisor on the club for about five years now, um, for a few years just as a volunteer advisor, and after a while the interest picked up. The reason why we're here today is to seek permission to go on an overnight trip from January 30th through February 2nd. Um, it's titled the Harvard Model United Nations. It takes place at the Sheraton Hotel in Back Bay, Boston. Um, there are schools from all over the world, about a dozen or so schools from the United States, um, 
well, actually, a half a dozen schools from Massachusetts, several dozen from around the United States, and countries represented as far as China, Japan, India, parts of Africa, and Latin America as well. Jeremy a actually was uh, given the opportunity to take part in this as a ninth grader. This would be Casey's first experience. I'm here for any questions about logistics that the committee may have, but I did bring the students to give their um, you know, spiel on why they would like to go and what they hope to achieve or gain from the experience. So yeah, when I first went to Harvard Model United Nations, sorry, Harvard Model United Nations during my freshman year, uh, it was with mostly kind of an old guard of seniors and juniors who were leaving the program. And I guess now I've become that old guard. So I'm <laughs> really excited to kind of go back to Harvard Model United Nations and hopefully bring new interest into the club and fresh blood, as we put it. Um, although, not actually. No. Uh, <laughs> um, so with, um, you know, hopefully bringing, we have several freshmen and sophomores who are going, as well as juniors who will hopefully perpetuate the club after we and the other seniors are gone. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I thought it was an incredible experience, mostly because of just the sheer diversity of people that were there. Uh, I think that the statistics were like 35 different countries represented. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are people from 35 different countries that one actually has the opportunity to go out and meet with and talk with and communicate with and really gain a perspective on international affairs that you would not see anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then it, there's also the opportunity to kind of learn about that international politics, which is something that you, you don't see often within high school. I mean, you might learn about world history and, you know, new imperialism of Portugal, but, um, you know, that, that's probably about it. Um, I mean, I guess we, we have mo modern, per, we, have, we have a current events class, right. um, which, well, is nice. It doesn't really uh, carry the in-depth amount of knowledge and learning that uh, Harvard mm -hmm. Model Nations offers. Great. As you've heard, I haven't gone on this trip before. I actually haven't been involved in the club before, but I saw it as a great opportunity, as a great learning experience, and I plan on pursuing law, so it's a little bit away from politics, but my dad's encouraged me to go into international law, so any kind of experience I can gain. Um, I'm going to be, if we're allowed, I'm going to be playing the part of some French person's name that I can't really remember. It's John something, but I guess I have to be a man. Um, but I take French at the high school, and any chance to use my French vocabulary and learn about international policies, as well as just being exposed to all of the people our age in high school, in programs like this, really dedicated to what they're doing. It seems like a great experience to me, and I would really love to have the opportunity for the first time and the last time as a senior. And here's some good news. Politics and law do mix, because Mr. Venezzi <laughs> is a lawyer, and he's in politics. So I mean, look at that. I think he's my but dad's lawyer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm not international law. I'm just an authoritative. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works, right? Um, so this is at you said it's at Harvard, correct? It's um, thrown by Harvard, but it takes place in Boston. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the um, all the, the secretariat and all the um, committee members and heads of each committee are actually Harvard undergrads. So it's a really unique experience as um, as an advisor. And there is another chaperone that would attend. It would be Mr. Evan Nosi, another social studies mm -hmm. teacher. There's 13 of us, two chaperones. Uh, when we went a few years back, I believe the group had 12 and there were two chaperones. And uh, outside of the chaperones, it's very much, you know, Harvard undergrad driven from mm -hmm. start to finish. Mm -hmm. I mean, they maintain a website. There's anywhere from eight to ten months of preparation that go into it. Um, com uh, countries are assigned. Background guides are given. Study materials, hundreds of pages of information. Each student here would represent a different committee. Some students would uh, have two students per committee. Jeremy, do you remember yours off the top of your head that you would Last year, it was uh, disarmament, in, in disarmament in international security, I think. Sure. Somewhere so like that was uh, kind of talking about stopping nuclear proliferation. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was one other topic that we really didn't get into. They tend to have two topics, yeah. This year, the committees are Disarmament, International Security, Economic and Financial Committee, Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural <coughs> Committee, Special Committee on Decolonization, Legal Committee, World Health Organization, 
United Nations General Assembly on high-level meeting on Arab states, the Summit on Millennium Development Goals, Economic and Social Council, and then the one that Casey's on is actually a historic committee. There tends to be one historic committee. This one is the Historical National Constituent Assembly of France in 1789. So she's playing the part of Jean Sylvain, um, member involved in the French um, Revolution. She's going to so lose her head on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Depends on how it goes. And now they, so they stay over two nights in Boston? It would be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday okay. night. Okay. And are they responsible for their own transportation? Is there, will we the, um, the way it was done in the past and what we would do if we were given approval from here is have a parents meeting. Okay. Uh, the way it happened last time is parents met us at the high school Thursday after lunch. So they would miss their last block on Thursday. They drive us down to the Sheridan, drop us off. We're there throughout the three days and they, the same parents or a different group, we set that up, will pick us up midday on Sunday. Okay. In terms of time missed in school, it would be the last block on Thursday and the entirety of Friday. Okay. Um, this is well in advance, so they'd be getting all the school work they'd be missing and um, right. there's time to get it completed. I mean, the, the committee, the excuse me, the conference details haven't been put out yet in terms of the hour to hour, um, but based on how it's done every year and we've, we went a few years back, it's basically all day it's 8 to 9 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Wow. you know three-hour committee half-hour hour break three-hour committee um, half-hour hour break three-hour committee so mm. any other questions or comments? I, I was just curious with, with all the clubs but how, what's the actual membership I know 13 sure. members 13 are going on uh, are interested in going on this trip that's the maximum that we're allowed to take based on Harvard's yep. enrollment. Uh, at this club, we have probably double that in terms of total really? involvement, That's about great. 25. That's great. And it's, uh, I think uh, I was asked earlier, that has it been pretty steady? The, uh, two years ago, it waned a little bit because of the members who created the club were very senior heavy. So I think a year or two they came in to that. create this club. And <laughs> I always ask, what's the interest, you know? Sure. And it's good to see that. Yeah, it's pretty, even in this group, generally speaking, the people who want to go on this trip tend to be juniors or seniors because they, they're taking the higher level courses. They're interested more in the international mm -hmm. affairs. They're taking world history as juniors, which kind of sparks their interest. And then taking civics and governments as, senior, as seniors, which again, sparks the interest. But in the club as a whole, we have a lot of freshmen and sophomore interest Good. in the club, Good. if not necessarily this great. trip yet. Yeah. You know, so. Anything else? Uh, at this time, I'll obtain a motion to approve the trip to the Harvard Model United Nations. Move to approve. Second. Further the discussion? Harry Nunn, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. Good luck, guys. Have fun. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Okay, it's trip night tonight. Um, we have the annual request for the Washington, D.C. trip from superint Superintendent. Oh. I did. Oh. Oh. The second time that's happened. Oh. Principal O'Connell of the Middle School. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. That's Mimless. okay. I've always wanted to be a middle school principal. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always wanted to be a superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> I have a long way, long road ahead of me. So I, I think you have the itinerary. I'm just here to answer any questions. If the itinerary is not any different than it has been over the past several years, and just to speak to Mr. Pisopoulos' point, uh, it's a great opportunity for civics. It's a great opportunity for middle school students to learn some US history, which unfortunately is not in their curriculum in the middle school social studies. Um, it's world history and geography. So it's a great opportunity for them to learn something about their country. I just had some simple questions. Um, pretty much the same itinerary as the past mm -hmm. years? Yes. And the price seems about the same, right? Yes. It might even be a little lower. I can't remember. But I think it's exactly the same as it was last year. Okay. And I know that we do the scholarships, raise funds, businesses, donate money, help. Yeah. I have to say, last year I was overwhelmed with the generosity of the eighth grade class, the current freshman class. Many parents sent in donations mm -hmm. to cover wow. scholarships for those other students that may be in need of financial assistance. And it was very, very generous of, of the community. And what percentage of the, do you know what percentage of the students went last year or on average go? I would say 75 to 80 percent of the students attended last year and, and, and in the previous year, which I would think would be the same. We have a very large class. This right. current so class is 242 students, so it's going to be a big trip that's if a, the same yeah. percentage goes. Yeah. And um, so we talked about the money. But the other thing was, so on the uh, the alternate <coughs> the alternate activities for the students that stay behind, 
Students not required to do that, correct? If a student wants to do neither, they stay at school. And then what's what's the plan of action? For we try we try very hard to come up with enrichment activities for them to do that, in some way replicate what they might experience if they were able to attend either the DC trip or the day trip. And we you know we do that with the teachers who stay behind. We take mostly teacher chaperones, but there are obviously many teachers, eighth grade teachers, who remain on campus and they put together an enrichment you know series of activities for the students to do some academic but some also just trying to get some of the culture into the school that they would have experienced if they were able to go into Boston or DC there's usually a reason why someone may not you know may not want to do the local trips and we try to take that into consideration as well when we you know come up with an appropriate set of activities mm -hmm. for them anybody else have anything questions yeah, I was going to say, Mrs. Imbriano <laughs> may be one of our chaperones. Yes, oh, well. I was for Ashley. Well, can she vote on anything? It depends. Is she paying or is she going to something? No, the chaperones are free. Oh, no. Really? The chaperones are free. It's oh, hard work. I don't think she should vote. <laughs> um, the one other question or comment I'll make, um, take it as you will, is on, on the local activities, are, are there more... I don't want to say educational, but I will say education. For example, I'm thinking art museums. Um, the fr I see Bunker Hill here, but what about the Freedom Trail? Um, those kind of things. I, I don't mind uh, with a one-day canopy lake. I understand because the students right. down there are going to uh, an amusement park for a day. But but like the Duck Tour Day kind of left me flat. Um, we, we, these are not finalized, so we can certainly look for something more, more academic or more cultural. I know that the seventh grade every year goes to the Museum of Fine Arts, okay. so that that's an I annual trip read, for right, them. But there's that. so much to offer in well, Boston. Well, the Museum. There's yep. other museums. Um, we had that discussion three years ago about the alternative trip. Yeah. Yep. You might want to try to get them over to Fenway Park and places <laughs> like that. <laughs> I was just going to say, there's the Equitarium and there's a Stonehenge. Mm. Yeah. Which in is New Hampshire and Stonehenge. Right. Yeah. And Salem, Salem, New Hampshire. Yeah. Hampshire. Yeah. America Stonehenge. I will do. I will do that. I will pursue some alternative. Okay. Kind of. Academic and the, and the activities tour is a pretty good. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a good, good, it is a good tour. It is without having yeah. to walk the trail itself. Correct. Correct. But I think Washington D.C. I mean, I don't think there's a single place in the United States where you could take kids for an educational trip that would be better I than Washington D.C. I have to say, it, it really, it really it's is amazing. an amazing. You remember experience. that all your life. When you a go lot there of those, kid. a lot of those kids might never get there yeah. as kids or until they're you know young adults or even older. So I think exposing yeah, them. It really is. You know, my two kids and your kids went there with them. Yeah. I mean, your kids, yeah. really the only your grandkids and the only kids. And better <laughs> trip than that would probably be to Cooperstown. Right? Cooperstown, <laughs> right. That, I mean, or yeah. can but but DC, we do a Hall of Fame yeah. tour. But oh, D.C. Yeah. is amazing for the number of things you can see in a drop period of time. It's it is. Incredible. It is. Any other questions? At this point, I'll... Why don't they get to stand at uh, Lincoln Memorial and look down the reflecting pool? Yeah. Yeah. I just hope everything's open. Open, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the reflecting pool hasn't been, but yeah. hopefully it will be this year. And that picture, I love the picture that they take. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So at this time, if there's no further questions, let's obtain a motion to approve the annual trip to Washington D.C. by the eighth grade. So, so moved. So, I'll, I'll give Cliff the motion. I'll give Janine <laughs> second. the second. I think Cliff beat her. Yeah. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. Four zero. Have Thank fun. You. Thank you. See you later, Superintendent O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I might as well, I, I've already dug myself a deep enough hole, I might as well bury myself in it now. This could be a coup. I know. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't have revealed, I shouldn't have revealed our plans, Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, next we're going to shift to Mr. Patrick Daly, and he's going to give us an analysis of the district's MCAS scores. Patrick? Thank, Thank you, folks. I'm just passing out a brief PowerPoint. I, I took one. Is there anything in our handouts in the MCAS, or? Oh, okay. This is coming from Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, this is a has been. This is a has look been. Look up Yes. Right. Yeah. The, the test that will won't be for much longer. <laughs> uh, this one you figure it out. Right. Sure. We will certainly still have a state assessment. What what it's called is what's right. They said the other day they wish they'd just called it MCAS 2, right? Mm -hmm. 2.0. Um, then none of us would have realized the difference. I wasn't able to come up. This is why, because I didn't really know this. Yeah. 
So very briefly, I just want to walk through uh, not only the, the analysis that I've done, but the process we have as a district. Part of our strategic vision in our district is to make data analysis something that happens district-wide. It happens at every level. It's not something that I do or that the superintendent does. It's something that every teacher, every parent, every student is involved in data analysis at some, at some point. So just a quick uh, walkthrough of, of uh, our process that we have in place and also um, a, a focus on a few areas that I spoke about last year and I wanted to follow up on. So just to uh, start off, on October 11th, we had a full day professional development day. We spent the early part of the day talking about data and looking at data in teams at our schools. All of our educators were led by curriculum leaders and principals for a close analysis of MCAS um, on that day. And it was, it nicely dovetailed with our activities in the afternoon, which was edu edu uh, excuse me, educator evaluation goal setting, which is based and influenced by data. So it was a nice, uh, a nice program for that day and, and well received. Um, we've been using all kinds of analysis at the building level, using a uh, system called Edwin, which I'll explain a little bit in a moment. Um, our curriculum leadership also does a close analysis and submits it to us that we were able to uh, look at w the, the measure from that day and from that discussion that goes on. Um, I also conduct more in-depth analysis. I try to look back for five years to see some trends that have developed. And also, like I just mentioned, the connections to all these different aspects. So this is what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. So last year I talked about Education Data Warehouse, which we trained all of our teachers in. We expanded the number of educators who have access to the, this is the state warehouse for data where they're able to run reports. Uh, we, we included all of our curriculum leaders, principals, team leaders, and some grade level leaders at the elementary school who were able to access this information and run reports uh, for the purpose of analysis. The state changed the system a little bit. It is now called Edwin Analytics. Um, it's a similar uh, program and warehouse. It's just Edwin is a bigger uh, system which, which we will continue to explore it as different facets. This, this piece is still the, the data analysis. So it's very similar. Uh, but it does offer some different tools uh, than we had in the past. So teachers were retrained and able to use this with their, uh, with their groups that they led. Another tool that we have, we're working with uh, a man named Steve Bogdanoff, who's from the local DSAC, which is a branch of the Department of Education. And he's worked on us uh, with what's called the Visual Analy Analytic Resources. This is the MCAS Visual Analytic Resource, and this is called the MVAR. You may have seen Kathy O'Connell uh, present last year on a tool um, that she developed here. So basically what this is, this is a, an Excel spreadsheet that is meant to take all those reports that are in the warehouse and very quickly go visual is a term that we use when we look at data. And it very quickly through color throws up green, red, yellow. You're able to look across uh, many different areas. So this is something that our principals and teachers have have really responded to. So we are uh, working very hard using this as another tool at our disposal to, to look at data. Um, I think when, when uh, the superintendent saw this, she said this is what took her weeks and weeks to compile. This was something you could do very instantaneously. And it works with the data warehouse to instantly import the numbers and populate. So it's a great uh, tool that they're sharing with us and we're, uh, we're, use we're utilizing. Um, as a district, we've developed a unified response. So we created a form. So when our teachers go through the process of analyzing, there's a reporting out process as well. So this is where they collect um, by grade level, by school. They observe, we look at you know, where were our strengths, where were our weaknesses, what are some suggestions that we have for improvement. So just a structured, we, we really spent some time simplifying this process last year and it worked well. But now the teachers are able to report back with some statistical analysis, but also some qualitative uh, responses. So here are just a few brief examples of some of the information coming back from a middle school English language arts. You know, we should continue to integrate nonfiction inform inf informational text into our practice. We should increase writing practice for longer pieces and include a wider variety of writing purposes, expository, persuasive, narrative, descriptive. We need to hit all four consistently. So this is comes from their examination of where students did well. At the elementary school with English language arts, they said teachers need to continue doing what we see gets results in student work. Example, writing with colors, six traits writing, teacher supplemented uh, and created reader response instruction. We need to stay focused in incorporating methods that will help us improve the areas that data shows is an area for need for our district. 
in uh, middle school mathematics, there's a stronger focus on comprehension and mathematical vocabulary and literacy. So this is really the, the thinking behind, which then you can see how this would easily lead into some action steps and next steps uh, at the school level, goals and, and the like. Um, a little bit of the work that I've been working on here, we talked about this last year and many of the same areas uh, continue uh, as areas of improvement. Our open response and short response scores in English language arts, our writing prompts and composition scores, our short answer and open responses in math, and our rigorous questions in ELA and math. All areas that need, uh, need some improvement as well as our high needs subgroup, our special education, low income, and English language learners combined for a high needs subgroup. These are our areas in need of improvement. I spoke to you last year about the importance of, if we can focus on writing, there's a real great chance to see our scores improve. When you look at areas where we can gain some points overall, we can really do so with our writing. And this has been an area of focus. So Patrick, just yes. one question. So when, when you decide where we're gonna focus the, the need for improvement, mm -hmm. is it one, <clears throat> the schools or the grades where they've either been ranked level two or where we are, that's where you start, correct? Yep. But do you also go to, even when we're doing well, we can still do better at, at every level, which is our goal, to, to do better at every level. So does that also get some time, or is it just not the we ability do. to do that? We try to, we, everything gets, gets time. This is just where, not only am I focusing with the district, but also where I'm focusing with you tonight. So I mean, uh, there are other pieces to this that okay. we, we, we can dig into the actual question level, we can dig into uh, areas across, again, it's, especially with the new accountability system, there's all sorts of incentives to not just be improving your weakest areas. To go from proficient to advanced, you can gain points for, for moving. So in any area where there is room for growth, that is a, a, a place to concentrate. Just one quick example, and we yep. all talked about this, was eighth grade science, which mm -hmm. the scores are low throughout the state, so mm -hmm. it's not just a North Reading issue. But we're all sitting here saying, how can you know, the advanced be so low mm -hmm. on eighth grade science? It was like 5%, 6% or something like that. Sure. And, is, so that's an area that you would continue to look at and see why, and, and obviously there's some issues statewide with that, so. Absolutely, yeah, we fo we're focusing on all areas, and every curriculum leader in every area is leading an investigation into that particular grade level. So in eighth grade, there's only one test for all of middle school, right. so that, the, the added uh, piece there is there's one test, but then trying to figure out through an integrated program which grade levels can improve on these different areas and work together. So every, every subject area, every place. Um, but again, I think through educator evaluation and through everything else, we're trying to focus on a few areas because you can do everything. You can spend all your time doing everything. So to folk getting more bang for the buck, really finding an area to focus and seeing did we make an improvement, a targeted improvement is what we're looking for. So some examples are our writing prompts for grade four. This is going back a few years. Um, this is just showing composition scores and convention scores for the long composition. Uh, we are somewhat in the same place we were if you go back three years. We've improved a little <coughs> bit from 643 and 636. Um, about the same, a little bit lower from where we were last year. So definitely something we want to continue to improve. One thing I want to stress, I think it's been made clear to you though, this is quite a time of flux and transition with the tests, with the standards. Um, for example, they've, they've made all kinds of crosswalks, but what we think of as composition and conventions is being crosswalked as text types and purposes and production and distribution of writing in the new 2011 standards. So there's a lot changing with these question types and students and teachers were uh, encountering a, a di slightly different uh, types of writing than they've ever seen before in these assessments. So we're going to be seeing a lot to, uh, to learn. So it's very helpful when we look at that to compare ourselves to uh, other similar districts. So these are our DART districts again. These are, for, for this grade level, these are districts that are similar in composition of uh, low income, special education, uh, student enrollment. So we're looking at Foxborough, Grafton, Hanover, Linfield, Marblehead, Medway, Newburyport, North Reading, Reading, Sandwich, and Wilmington. And we are, this is alphabetically arranged. You can see when it's arranged by, uh, maybe you can't see, it's pretty <laughs> tight. But we are, we are third in both areas there, Linfield, Reading, North Reading, and the top three. And if, if you recall, it's only one year trend, but from where we were last year, we've moved, you know, that's, that's a good place to be. We always want to be number one, obviously. Um, but we, we're doing 
when you look at us compared with our peers, we're doing, we're doing pretty well in this area. So everybody's going through that transition of new kinds of questions, new kinds of assessments. There was a writing prompt last year that had a little bit of uh, it was fiction, real or imagined. They, wo they wove the imagined in there a little bit, which is a new variable that, that everyone in the state was grappling with last year. Uh, for seventh grade open response, uh, I, what I did here, similar to last year, we looked at the average score. So we took the several open response questions and took the average of those scores. We've seen a steady increase here, 249, 25, 236, 2526. Last year, uh, we talked about the number of blanks and how that was decreasing. We're still lower than we were before, it went up by one, but it's, it's good to see that the, the lower number of blanks indicates students aren't panicking, they're not freezing, they know what to do, they're, they're, they're more confident when they're taking the test. So this is an area that we definitely want to see zeros there. We want to see students know what to put down and that they're comfortable um, with, with some test taking strategies and with answering the questions. Uh, at the bottom here, I just took this year's open response just to show you uh, the four seventh grade questions. We have um, a non, there was a nonfiction, two fictions, and a nonfiction. What I highlighted in red there, the 12 and the 46, is a place where we were below the state average. Um, with, uh, I'm sorry, this, this shows where we increased from the past. Uh, we had more uh, in the ones and the twos category than we had in the years prior. So I think that definitely an area of focus. And what I'm showing you over to the right is we have the ability, there are some questions that are published and shared. It's wonderful when that happens because the teachers with the students can go back and look at the actual questions and practice that response and similar responses for the future. So one thing that you'd notice here is that this is an area of weakness, but we do have the question. It's a great opportunity for us to actually dig in and see what we can do specifically with that type of a question to improve. This is eighth grade uh, open response. Again, the writing, <coughs> even in the mathematics, is an area of improvement. You saw that what, what I was happy to see is when the math at the middle school got back to us through their, uh, their analysis, they came across the same thing, that they really could see some improvement in the language and vocabulary and how students can write about and explain their mathematical thinking through writing. Uh, what I highlighted in red were some, these are the areas that were slightly below the state average. So this is something you can see in the analysis that we are, um, these are our scores, but anything that's red, you know, what, what's going on with that question where North Reading is kind of uh, a little bit behind even the state average on this uh, particular question. Why, you know, what can we do here to improve? And we always, when we talk about that, we say, is it something that we can do differently with our curriculum? Is it something we can do with our instruction? Um, and maybe through some other interventions, get the students where they need to be. I think that's important because this might sound outrageous, but I really don't think we should be behind the state average in anything. Mm -hmm. It's my yeah. personal opinion. It just opinion. sounds like we must have missed that <laughs> right. topic completely right. somewhere in the some, curriculum. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And it, it, can, it can be many, many reasons why. It's just, you know, it's, again, this is one year that I'm yeah. showing you right. there. So, you know, I, I didn't show you this. If you definitely saw for three years in a row, that there is a, a, a red uh, where we're below the state average on a certain type of question, then that's where you, I, I would really look at the curriculum and say, does our, does our curriculum not address geometry the right, way it needs right, to? Right. We need to now teach that for two weeks or for three weeks more than we do or something like that. Bring in another program, bring in some other resources. So this is the kind of analysis that, that we're doing. So some next steps, a uh, lot of co uh, common assessment development. Because MCAS is just one measure, whether it's PARC, MCAS, it's one measure, it's an external measure. It has a place, it has a value, but we really want to improve our process for assessing our students in common so that we can see these trends develop. And if you see geometry issues on the MCAS and also in your common assessments, that tells you something. If you see that they're balancing out, that tells you something else. Maybe that uh, it has to do more with the questions than with the curriculum. So this is very important for us to look at. We're continuing with this, uh, the VAR training that I was speaking with the visual analytic resources. There's a team right now uh, <coughs> consisting of myself, uh, Principal Sean Colleen, Chris Molly, and our district data specialist, Nan Cook, are taking part in a training to learn more about these tools and to create some tools to use back in the district. Principal Kathy O'Connell uh, took part in that course last year and developed a great tool. Um, we're going to continue our professional development, look at our Title I and other interventions. You know, how can we use all the resources we have in our district to really help out those students that need the most support? Uh, continue to look at the Massachusetts tiered system of support as a district, our CPI gap having targets, and 
a real connection between educator evaluation, student learning goals, and what the district determined measures, which I've mentioned before. We're really starting to see those pieces come together, the professional development, the data-driven leadership, and also educator evaluation and accountability. And teachers are really seeing how you know, those student learning goals really are data-driven, and they're going to focus on certain areas and really want to see those results. It becomes uh, a, a real um, exciting synthesis of those three pieces. We also uh, have our transitions, the Common Core Math. As we know, there's an increased rigor, perseverance, inf increased emphasis on the transfer skills. For this year, there's a full transition to 2011 in grades three to eight. So in the, in the past, in last year, the questions that were asked on the assessment were common to both the old and the new frameworks. This year, all of the questions will be to the new frameworks, and to that end, we have all of our curriculum is a fully aligned in grades three to eight with common core standards. In grades nine and 10, the, it'll be similar to the way it was in the past for three to eight. The content on the assessments will match the same content from the, the, the former 2000 standards. So next year in mathematics will be a full implementation of the common core standards. And that's because the students currently in ninth, uh, in 10th grade have not been receiving the common core uh, scope and sequence. They will be in that position for next year. So we will have new courses ready for them uh, in the, for next year to match with those assessments. In ELA and literacy, we have a full implementation in all grades for this year, K to 12. Um, the grade four and seven narrative, expository <coughs> or opinion, as I mentioned, the assessment, uh, the writing has changed a little bit. Increased content area reading and writing, science and social studies. So we're going to be seeing research-based questions where students do a, a mock or, or a practice research assignment for a writing question. So we're going to see a lot of different kinds of questions than we've, than we've been seeing in the past. So that will definitely affect our, uh, our data and, and the analysis that's going to follow from there. And a quick update on science and social studies. There is uh, a new science framework expected this winter. There are no plans at this time to change those assessments. You will still have assessments in science at grades uh, five, eight, and then we do the biology exam in grade nine here. And um, again, literacy and social studies, uh, no, no assessment for social studies, but we will be reinforcing through science and social studies, students' understanding of informational texts how to do proper research, and close reading and writing at those levels. Uh, we will continue with our focus on writing. We saw some improvement this year, but we want to continue with that. So we, we've looked at, um, again, with really developing rubrics across the district uh, for all subject areas to really work on how we're scoring our writing and making sure that we are all in sync as teachers and educators on how we're scoring writing in order to have validated to talk to one another about student writing. Um, using a program called Writing with Colors, which is a program that uh, I was a part of creating in Waltham that I brought uh, to the district last year. It was very well received. We've been buying tons of markers and getting out to classrooms. Lots of direct time with teachers to use this approach uh, that, that really works well and the students have responded very well to. And hopefully that will lead to some increased uh, student scores because of uh, improved student writing. Uh, Common Core Expectations, as I mentioned, and I, I just referred to that we have a VAR training team of four that's going out with the district. So any questions? Just the first make, pitch is that. I'll make a comment. <laughs> yes. Um, and I think there is, maybe caused by me to some extent, is there's going to be a lot of anxiety as we switch over to these new tests. Mm -hmm. And obviously you and Kathy and other administrators and teachers are involved in that, in that yes. switch over. Um, I think the anxiety surrounds everything I've read is that be, be prepared for your scores to plummet. And, and when I hear that, it just makes no sense to me because um, if we're changing, if, if, if Massachusetts is doing as well as it is, both nationally and internationally, mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I get confused by what we're trying to, to accomplish here. And I don't know if you can answer that, but I, I, yeah. I, I don't get it, I guess. I'll, I'll say a couple of things. First, um, I think we do need to separate out the anxiety around the field test and the actual test. The, the work that they're doing around the test, I, I, I've been at the forefront of le learning and listening to it. There's a lot of exciting things that, that are coming with it. Um, the positives being, you know, being able to assess different types of skills than have ever been assessed before. Um, 
the ability to take the test on the computer, when you see what you're actually able to do, there's a lot of exciting uh, possibilities. There's, there's ways to assess types of thinking that a fill in the circle test can't quite assess. If you're able to take your finger and drag and drop things and show relationships and patterns in math, that's very, very exciting. I think uh, on the other side, it's always difficult to transition and to, you know, w just using technology, there's challenges there. Uh, and, and the many questions that come with, um, with the transition. So overall, I think what's coming with this new assessment, MCAS will change no matter what, and it's due to change to align with Common Core and to align with what's changing in the world. Um, I, I think that we're in a good place with PARC. You do hear states that are pulling out of the field test of PARC right now. Uh, it'll be interesting. I, I still think a lot of the, those states are still committed to a, an assessment, a national assessment. They're questioning right now the cost of the implementation and things like that. For our state, the, the cost is actually, uh, I think it's even still a little bit lower per student than what they were spending before, I believe. So we're still in it, we're still in the driver's seat. As far as the scores changing or plummeting, they're assuring us there's crosswalks are gonna be able to match up. I, I'm still confident that our scores will, will be steady. Um, there will be a learning curve. There are some major shifts. I mean, one of the most major shifts is up until now, we have not had the writing scores dependent on the reading scores, and that relationship is going to be there in the future. They're going to get a passage, and they're going to have to write to their reading. So those are related. So it'll be very interesting to see how those scores are related. It does make sense, though, that students should be able to read and write. That is the skill that they need, and so it, it will be interesting to see that um, in the future. But. I, you know, without having really seen the test and lived through it, I, I, I certainly hope that, that the scores continue to be uh, strong as they have been in the past. Any other comments? Questions? Do you think that the, uh, the new testing will help improve our teaching? Or is it just another method of assessing what was taught? So uh, will the testing improve our teaching? I, I don't... I think it's more information for teachers to make a decision. And uh, I, I think it has its place. And I, and I think that what we're doing as a district to try and bring in the level of assessments, trying not to think of them as testing. It's another assessment, it's another piece of data to inform what we're doing in the classroom. Um, I think my biggest concern is over testing, too much time spent just on the testing and taking away from actual instructional time. But if we can start to view this as not super high stakes, but as formative, as more information to help us along the way, I think that can inform our teaching. It's not the end all be all. We don't want our, our teachers judged by a test. We don't want our students judged by a test. But I do think testing has a place. It gives you a certain kind of data. Multiple choice has a place. It gives you a certain kind of quick response and data. These tests really try to, they're claiming they're going to have a lot more performance-based assessments where students are able to demonstrate their thinking and their learning, which is what the Common Core is trying to measure. They're trying to come up with assessments to measure that. So without having seen them yet, it's hard to say, but I do think that they can be helpful in trying to do that for us. At the same time, I think our teachers are developing some excellent assessments here. And I, I do hope that in the future they give us a lot of, uh, in the past we've always had district uh, ways of measuring performance. And I think that should continue and I hope that it does. I hope that they don't try to legislate this is what it has to look like. I think there should be trust in, in a local uh, school district because we're doing a very good job with our assessments. We really are, as you can see through all the presentations. We have a great system in place. Anything else? I think we're, you know, we continue to do well in MCAS. We have our problem areas. It seems that you all know what the problem areas are and are focused on working to fix those. So confidence that we're moving forward in the right direction. Yeah. Next few years should be interesting. It will be. <laughs> Great. It will be. Thanks, Patrick. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. <coughs> okay. Let's get back to the agenda and to continued business, the school building project update. Kathy? Yes. Thank you. The last secondary school building committee meeting was held on October 22nd, beginning at 6.30 p.m. In terms of a construction update, the brick on the exterior of Building A, which is the high school academic wing, is now complete, complete excuse me, and the work has moved to Buildings C and D. Work, over, work on the roofs over Buildings B and C is moving forward and should be weather tight by the end of November. All of the new construction should be weather tight by the end of December, beginning of January. 
<clears throat> excuse me, on the inside of the building, the auditorium frame is complete. Work in the ceiling will continue for the next four to five months, and then the staging will come down. The gymnasium slabs will be installed by the first week of November, but actually, that pour started today, so they're ahead of schedule. Three pours, I think. Three, yeah, pours, three pours, yes. yes. And then work on the locker rooms will begin. But the actual concrete was delivered today, and we had many cement um, trucks driving in and out all day. One thing you don't have here is that they've also begun construction of the team building for the, the turf field. The team building on the turf field, that's right. correct. Which is kind of between the old high school gym, locker room area, and the turf field, closer to the turf field. Correct, to the right of the stands. To the right of the stands, right. Yes. In terms of the design update, um, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment process, again, is well underway. Both principals, the Director of Academic Services, Rob Usler, our representative from Durham Whittier, Rob Fogarty, our representative from Tavares, who is the furniture vendor, and I met on Friday, October 18th, and uh, then again met on October 22nd. We are taking a look at the furniture binder, discussing the process for comparing the uh, design plans to the actual furniture assigned to each room, walking through the binder page by page to identify who will be responsible for the review to ensure that every space on the design drawings has a corresponding page of furniture. We're working on this particular um, initiative through November 8th, and that will be followed by a meeting on November 15th to review the updated binder. At the same time that we're doing this work, on both the middle school and the high school, we're doing the work on the central office. So tomorrow I will be meeting with the central office administrators to look at the revised schematic design of the central office. You may recall that changed when it was determined that the LGR um, exterior walls would remain and would be added to as opposed to total new construction. So we took a look at the new design um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to go over that design with the administrators and then meet with the support staff on Wednesday um, to make sure that what we need um, will be in place. And then the designer met with the chief of police recently regarding the security system in the new facility. I met with the designer and the supervisor of buildings and grounds today to review some of the recommendations that had been made by the chief and several of his officers. And both the designer, um, the supervisor of building and grounds, and I will meet with the chief next Tuesday to review those recommendations regarding the security system. Some of them are easily achieved, others not so easily. Um, at the meeting of the SSBC, we uh, re reviewed and approved change order eight, and then went into executive session um, at 7.12 p.m. and returned to open session at 8.13 p.m. Um, a special SSBC meeting that was scheduled for tomorrow has been canceled. I just received an email, so that special meeting will not take place. So the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Secondary School Building Committee will be on Tuesday, November 5th, beginning at 5.30 p.m. in the High School Modular Cafeteria. Mr. Bowers, Mr. Venezia, or Mrs. Imbriano may have uh, additional information to add. Um, the only thing I'd add is if you drove by today or on Friday, the uh, windows are going in on the second floor of A building, and it looks like the windows will be probably completely in an A building by the end of the week, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, window, windows go fast, yeah. including the middle section? No, 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 the no. Cur that curtain's going to take some time. Okay. I think that's probably within the next, what, two to three weeks, Cliff, that's they're going to be working to be on that? in the next two weeks. Two weeks. But the actual, the, the windows are, are going right. in very quickly, and they're moving around the building, starting on the, on the middle floor, I'm not sure why, and then, you know, they'll do first floor and third floor. Uh, Cliff and I took a tour. <coughs> Cliff and I took a tour on Thursday, and again, they're moving very quickly inside of A building and starting to move over into B uh, and C with the utilities, with the electric and the HVAC and things like that. Um, and it's really, it's really starting to take shape. You can really, when you're inside A building, you really see how everything, the classrooms are lined up. They're doing a lot of sheetrock work. Uh, it's, it's, it's moving rapidly. Cliff? Um, one of the best best things to hear was on Thursday's site meeting, they were discussing the heating plan for the initial heating of the building That's good. as the winter comes. That's great. How, how they were going to achieve that. <laughs> when I start talking about heating the building, that's a that's real good. milestone. Yes. The masonry, the brick masonry is moving very quickly because I think the contract has an incentive yeah. to get as much of that done as possible before the real winter sets in. So they're, they're moving fast. 
some of the uh, some of the mechanical equipment is going into place now mm. as well I was just wondering um, I was not there this past Thursday is the skylight complete y yes oh, yes oh yeah yeah, it's done. It's uh, it's it's nice. <laughs> and I've I've got a few comments on the skylight. People saying, "Well, what do we need something like that's to get light like from the work. sky?" What do you well, think? Yeah, we that's have that's actually part of our our lead certification, which uh, allows us to get an additional two percent um, reimbursement from the state by having um, extra light coming in, natural, uh, natural light. Nice. And if you if you walk into the classrooms. They have huge windows. I can see many a day without having to turn on the lights in a lot of those classrooms mm -hmm. because of the the size of the windows in those rooms. And you have to remember that building's a big building, yes. and there's a lot of there's interior space. Room. I mean, those interior hallways are well away from exterior windows, obviously, because they're inside the classrooms. Right. So that right. that's coming right down in the right. middle, right through all three floors, it's all three levels, all the three, two, and one. Yep, and yeah. it's going to be, and it's it's a uh, Cliff has the right name for it, but it's an opaque. A type of skylight. It's not like mm -hmm. a clear glass, right. so it mm -hmm. filters the light through, you know, through that glass. So, mm -hmm. material is called cow wall. Cal what wall. it is is a, a yeah. fiberglass and uh, insulation and fiberglass sandwich that has a oh. high thermal uh, resistance as well as uh, being translucent. So yeah. it won't be really hot in there when the sun's coming no. through because it'll filter that out. No, but it brings the light in without. Yeah, not only is it translucent, but it brings the light in too. So <laughs> yeah, the light coming through there. <laughs> I, I also you believe, can't play basketball on it. I also believe they're going to be over the winter break, over the um, Christmas, New Year's break, they're going to be getting into the middle school and looking at a few things in there, I thought they said. They will be going into the ceiling during right. all of the breaks, the December break, the February break, and the April break to start take a look at some of the infrastructure right. and, and get a better sense of what they will be facing when they take over the building in June. Right, so they can jump right into it mm -hmm. in Correct. June. Yeah. Correct. I have one more comment? Yes. Mr. Chair. Um, I've been working very closely with the Director of Finance and Operations and the Supervisor of Building and Grounds um, to get a better understanding of any increases to operational costs when we open up the new building. So we plan to make a report to the school committee at the December 9th school committee meeting. Great. That's excellent. Good. I think people are going to want to know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And then obviously we need to know that for budget purposes Correct. for next year. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, revised budget goals. These are the goals we reviewed um, last week. I took a look at them, and uh, to Cliff's uh, great satisfaction, number nine uh, remains in there on the uh, <laughs> reducing athletic fees. And uh, I'm fine with that because we say continue to explore um, as a long-term budget goal, and, and I'm fine with that because I think it should, it should stay on there. Um, and, and you'll see later why it's difficult um, when hmm. Michael talks about yep. how much we're actually raising through fees and, and tuitions. Mm -hmm. So unless anybody has any questions on these, I'll take a motion to um, accept these as our fiscal year 2015 budget goals. So moved. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Thanks. Okay, policy manual updates. Cliff or Janine or Kathy, somebody? First one looks pretty simple, student activities. Uh, the, the, the policy, first policy we have is uh, student activities, JH, and uh, we're basically adding uh, two words at the end of the first paragraph in, so that it will read, he or she shall provide adequate supervision and administer finance, student finances and approve all student activities with the assistance of delegated members of the faculty and administration. A motion to approve first reading of revised policy JH student activities. So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. And next? Janine. Janine. And then next we have our school committee self test assessment tool. And what we've done with this is to Take the um, take the tool that we used this past year, three years actually, um, and it, and it's it's had you know some iterations along the way. But this is the one that we right. finally arrived at, mm -hmm. and we have uh, have typed in three letters at the top of it, 
BIA okay. and made it a policy. So this is a new policy then? This is a new policy. The old instrument the old, has been yeah, included in your packet for you to see BIA what used to be used. used. Okay. And it, I don't think it's possible to read this. No, I don't think we need to read this. I would, I'd like to go over it if we could. <laughs> the whole thing? Um, yeah. I, I, I would suggest that maybe Mr. Benet would <laughs> participate in the reading of All this. Right. I, think we just, read. <laughs> I think we just need to uh, um, approve for first reading replacement of the old self-assessment tool under policy BIA with the new self-assessment tool. So I will entertain a motion to do that. So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Four zero. Thank you, House and Senate Committee. Okay. Next minutes, we have none, correct? Budget update, Michael. Great. Um, so, in your packet this evening was the budget update for the month of October. And um, really, at this point in, in time, the, the schools have done a, a good job encumbering all their the majority of their expenses that are, are known at this time for the school year so you'll see on the expense report um, that the under the committed and encumbrance columns they're certainly increased from the September report um, and really the, there's really three kind of areas I wanted to kind of discuss this evening in summarizing the, the report um, certainly special education costs continue to be something that you will be certainly need to pay close attention to and continue to, to, to monitor um, certainly special education tuitions and transportation in particular. Uh, there has been some, some change in student placements and uh, increased services for, for students that has resulted in some higher than expected special education costs as we uh, look, approach uh, you know, the start of the school year. Uh, but again, as I've been uh, stating, fortunately, because of uh, the ability to prepay tuitions at the end of fiscal 13, we also re received some increased circuit breaker revenue because um, the reimbursement rate that the state set was higher than uh, we had anticipated during the budget season. So uh, because of these two factors, uh, any of these sort of unexpected costs or in increased costs at this time, we're easily able to absorb um, with, with our available balances within the budget, so it's not going to have a major impact on fiscal 14. Um, we have turned on the heat in the building, so utilities, that's something that we'll certainly pay close attention to as we approach the heating season. And um, again, it's too early to, to tell what the heating degree days are going to do as we approach the, the winter season, but we uh, will be closely watching that to see if there'll be any surplus funds to reapportion in the area of utilities as we approach the end of the, the fiscal year. Um, the food service program, and certainly we're going to keep a close eye out on the status of the food service program this year. I have worked with Chartwell's management to develop a budget template and I'll you know, meet with them shortly after the end of each month. So uh, I did that at the close of September and we've developed benchmarks for throughout the year that would uh, certainly uh, you know, minimize the amount of uh, general fund offset. And uh, at this point in time, the September report, uh, their, their projected loss was slightly greater than uh, they had anticipated. Uh, and speaking with Charles management, uh, they felt this was a, there was a need to build up some inventory levels that uh, for the start of the year, um, as well as the number of mails sold also continues to be slightly below what where we'd like to uh, you know, see them at based on what we've forecasted and projected. So uh, the number of mails sold continues to decline slightly. Um, so those two costs certainly impacted uh, September. Uh, there's certainly the the offset in our labor costs was certainly lower because of the reductions that we made. Um, so that's certainly helping any, any uh, you know, loss in revenue. Uh, but at this point in time, September was slightly, slightly you know, lower than we had hoped, but we'll continue to watch that closely as we move throughout each month. Um, on the payroll side, there's really no, nothing significant to report at this time. Um, you know, there was, as I reported in the past, we certainly have a need to fill some, some long-term leave, leave of absences with some long-term substitutes. Uh, some of those will have a budget impact, but at, you know, at this time, uh, you know, the payroll is within budgeted line items. So at this point, I'll open it up to any questions. Questions? Looks fine to me. Yeah. We Do just keep close watch on the, on the lunch program. Right. We already know our circuit breaker number. We, we do. We knew that. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. we, we so know. It. So we got we got the, more, the reimbursement rate came in at seventy five percent. Wow. 
and we had forecasted about 60 percent. So we have some increased revenue, which okay. is certainly helping some of these unexpected uh, you know, costs that have arisen. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. So the other item that was in your uh, packet was a request that uh, was made at the last uh, pool committee meeting um, regarding the fees, the major fees that we do charge our parents for, um, certainly athletics, user fee, extracurricular, the transportation and busing program, we, we charge a fee. And then the two tuitions, the, the full day kindergarten tuition and the preschool tuition. So what I put together was a five year uh, history of the revenue that we have collected from, from parents um, each fiscal year. And you can kind of see that you know, they have you know, remained relatively consistent. And then you, I also added a column for our FY14 general fund uh, offsets for these, for these major uh, you know, activities and programs that we do charge a fee for. Uh, so by looking at the report, you can see certainly in fiscal 14, um, these user fee and the revenue that we are collecting you know, is contributing to a, about a $1.1 you know, $1 million uh, general fund offset. So. Uh, as you know, as Mel stated earlier, it certainly would be uh, you know difficult to to do away with these fees in, uh, in any one particular budget year, um, as it is it is contributing it is bringing in a significant amount of revenue. Um, to that point, I'll just open it up to any particular questions. Do we have comments on this? Yeah, I just had a question, Mike. Um, the offset for FY14 on the transportation is three hundred twenty thousand. Yep. It, now I know that we have a new. We're operating under a new contract. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, how are we raising that additional? So revenue? what we're do, what we're using. There was a. Re, we had built up a little bit of a reserve okay. over these past you know, five years. So we typically only collect a little over two hundred thousand, as you as you can see. But I think um, there had been a reserve that had built up over the last five, six, seven years that we are utilizing in fiscal. So going 14. forward, next fiscal year, we're going to have to consider the cost for the. The transportation fee we, for the bus. We would, we would. and that's for yeah. that. That's mainly for the the mandatory students, right? The, is it K through six? So K through six, uh, any, with anybody within you know over two miles is, is free, right. and then there's optional busing for anybody that you know doesn't meet that in that with over two miles K through six guideline. Right. And then so seven through twelve, anybody who takes the bus has to has to pay. Has to pay. Correct. But that is something we're gonna have to look at. Yeah, we're gonna so have to take is, a look so at it. So we were able to to dip into that reserve to, to help the fiscal 14, but that won't be there. Right. So that'll have to be adjusted. So we're gonna have to make that up somewhere down. in the next fiscal year's budget. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's correct, yeah. And it's interesting, I mean, we, the athletic and extracurricular fees, I know we've increased them, I don't know when, but significant increases in both of those since fiscal year 09, 40,000, and the, um, we collected, uh, at fiscal year 13, we collected $261,000 yeah. in athletic fees and almost 78,000 in the extracurricular. Yeah. I believe that was the year. I, there was a history. I, I went through that the fees increased was beginning of fiscal ten. So you see that bump oh, okay, in right. revenue. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. It stayed real. It stayed relatively consistent. Well, thanks for doing this. It's good to have this picture, this uh, snapshot. It's helpful. Right. Any other comments, questions? Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michael. No uh, staffing report, Kathy. No, I will have one for the February twelfth meeting. Okay, but we. We do have a generous, a couple of donations, correct? Yes. I can find those now. I have in front of me. We have, um, we have two donations. Uh, I believe they're both from the Little School Parent Association. The first is a $430 donation from the Little School Parent Association to support funds needed for a grade one field trip to see Charlotte's Web. And I would... Uh, Accept a motion to accept this donation with gratitude. So moved. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. And then the second is another donation. This is a very generous donation of $8,000 from the Little School Parent Association uh, for two smart boards with projectors um, that will be installed in the grade four classroom and the kindergarten classroom. And the cost includes installation. Again, I'll entertain a motion to accept with gratitude. So moved. Second. For the discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, unanimous. Thank you very much to the thank middle thank school you. PTA. Yeah, thank goodness for the PTOs. The parents, they yeah. are extremely generous. Yeah. And that on top of the fees and yeah. we, we, we get there. We get there every year. Uh, subcommittee updates. I think the athletic subcommittee is uh, on here, Jerry. Uh, the athletic subcommittee uh, met um, 
I think it was last week. And the primary focus of the subcommittee's work over the last couple of meetings and probably for the next couple has been the uh, new building project. So we're trying to work out some of the details of the athletic facilities, including the gymnasium, uh, the uh, new all-purpose practice field, and the softball field. Um, and so we've been trying to narrow some of the issues down, and uh, I think we're going to continue to do that. We've talked about uh, um, things like amenities for the softball field, uh, things like irrigation, lighting uh, for the practice field, um, the um, fitness area, the uh, uh, auxiliary gymnasium. I know one of the things we resolved last week was uh, putting in additional volleyball um, nets on the the footings, on the right, parallel, right. the footings on the parallel courts, you know, uh, in addition to the competition courts. So we're just trying to do what I think, obviously, Kathy and the administrators are doing with some of the other areas with the, F, uh, uh, the fixtures and, and uh, equipment and stuff. And we're trying to do that with the gymnasium. So, mm -hmm. And like I said, there are some major issues. I mean, one of them is the irrigation issue as to whether right. or not we can bring it up to the practice field. Um, we have to take into consideration, you know, uh, leads points when we do that as well. So. I think that was the main issues. Yeah. Um, what else did we discussed? I know that we're also we're we're looking at it. We're working on our policy related to um, yeah. athletic fees. Correct. Um, right. And I think Michael's working on that with the policy and Kathy and the policy subcommittee. Right. That's yeah. correct. So yeah. we should have something in the next month or so. Mm -hmm. I would guess. Oh, yeah. Yes. 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 The next meeting, I'll bring some of that data that was talked about at that meeting right. and do okay. some anal further analysis. Right. Yeah. And then there was not a, uh, the policy subcommittee, we already, already talked about that. There mm -hmm. was not a NORCAM meeting this month. They did not hold a meeting. Okay. So, um, and then we have policy subcommittee coming up on the 14th. Athletic subcommittee, we set a date, right? We set a date of um, November 26th. I've heard back from some members of the, of the committee. In fact, I set out a schedule right. for the entire year, yeah. so. Um, 26 works obviously for me I, I just want to check and see if there are some issues that we're going to need to make a recommendation on prior to that uh, regarding the building project yeah, yeah. Mm. okay then we I'll, have I'll let you know finance okay. planning team on the 15th of November and we still have not gotten a date because I've never gotten back to the superintendent with my availability for communication subcommittee so we'll schedule that shortly um, administrative report Kathy yes <clears throat> earlier this evening I distributed um, what appears to be uh, a, a hefty administrative uh, supplemental report, but I'll be real quick, uh, just providing an overview of what is included in this packet. The first item um, of interest is the MASC workshop invitation and newsletter. MASC is going to be holding a park workshop. Park is the new assessment. Um, that has been discussed at this committee meeting and earlier meetings. This meeting will be held on December 7th from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. So an invitation as well as an overview of that workshop is included in your packet. A brief newsletter was also included um, with the invitation that provides an update on the joint conference that will be taking place in November. Mrs. Embriano and I will be attending that conference. There's also an article on school breakfast programs. Also included in your packet um, is the PowerPoint presentation that was provided at a workshop presented by my professional organization, the Mass Association of School Superintendents, and Dr. Patrick Daly and I did attend. I believe this PowerPoint would be the exact same PowerPoint that you would see if you attended the MASC workshop on December 7th. We did um, attend this workshop at the Worcester Technical High School where the MASC workshop is going to be held. This was uh, quite a presentation. There's lots of information that I'd be happy to discuss with you at a future school committee meeting. Um, but there were some, um, well, let's just leave it at that. We'll discuss it at a future meeting. Also included in your packet is a copy of the North Reading High School informational report card. This is one example of a report card that is put out annually by each of the schools across the school district. Um, and it's based on information that comes to us through uh, the data analysis of MCAS. So the North Reading High School always puts out this very nicely formatted um, informational report card that includes the core values and the beliefs for the high school. And finally in your packet um, is a 17-page, or is it? Yes, a 17-page summary 
of the um, workshop that I recently attended through the National Superintendents Roundtable in Washington, D.C. on October 4th through the 6th. Um, I belong to this organization. It, uh, you have to be invited to participate. There are 100 superintendents from all across the United States that belong to this organization, and 55 of us gathered in Washington, D.C. The focus of this particular weekend was uh, taking a look at the scores on international tests and how that relates to the performance of three European countries, France, um, Finland, and the last one was England. So um, in the report, it talks about the perspectives that were presented by uh, national leaders in education from each of those countries. And then in terms of the data analysis, we had a presentation um, by a gentleman who does an awful lot of work on research and policy regarding national and international tests. Finally, um, the, one of the presenters, Diane Ravitch, who is uh, an author, a researcher, professor of education at New York University, um, and a person who was the Assistant Secretary of Education and Counselor to the Secretary of Education, Lamar Alexander, in the administration of President George H.W. Bush. Um, she uh, is a renowned writer. She was very much involved in setting state and national academic standards. Um, and really spoke out in her early years uh, with her support around charter schools and v the voucher systems. And since she has continued to conduct her research around the success of these structures that had been set up originally under No Child Left Behind and now supported under Race to the Top, she's come to discover that they have not borne out the kind of results that had originally been intended and has done a 360 degree turn on what's now being touted as best practices in education. Her most recent book is called The Reign of Error. I sincerely encourage you to read this book. It is not a quick read, um, but I did obtain a copy and her presentation talked about the hoaxes that are being perpetrated um, on the American people in the name of school reform. And as a matter of fact, she calls the current reformers that are leading the way in this country corporate reformers. And she lays out the hoaxes that have been perpetrated um, throughout uh, her presentation at, in Washington, D.C. and in the book, Reign of Error. So I do have the book. I am plowing through it, and I'd be happy to go through that summary uh, at another time. You just want me to read it to get all agitated, probably. I encourage you to read it. I'd like to borrow it when you're done with it. And it's only about 600 pages, so. You're yeah. going to give us a book report. This right? is, I yeah. will give you a book report yeah, with visuals. Yeah. We'll go visual. <laughs> there are nine <laughs> hoaxes. We have plenty to read tonight when we get home. You so do. Yeah, this exactly. is good. Yeah, we're going to go through all this. <laughs> That's it. OK. Anything else? Well, we didn't make I 75 minutes. Oh, I Mr. Bowers. One so. item. Uh, the, uh, I handed uh, out a position paper coalition, mm -hmm. suburban coalition um, at our last meeting, and uh, they're trying to gather uh, what their position paper will look like for 2013. Um, and I wonder if anybody has any input to that. No. I reviewed it, but I didn't. I don't have any. It, it, uh, to be honest with you, I've searched my mind and, and soul for trying to come up with changes to this and I and I think that the uh, uh, 2012 legislative priorities are perfectly applicable to this year. 2013 yep. uh, as is there is one thought that uh, that came around that uh, I, I thought had some interest in our in our specific case and that is a, a local option for an income tax hmm the silence hit the room. I don't know if I'm crazy. <laughs> a local hospital? That would be in, in lieu of, of some property tax, obviously. Yeah. Wow. There'd be a property tax relief and, and uh, That'd be interesting, because I'm assuming the selectmen in, would, would administer that, correct? Uh, I would expect that it would probably be administered through the Department of Revenue as uh, you know, a, a, oh. a surtax on the income tax and be turned back to the well, we have yeah. our own meals tax. Now. I mean, that's interesting. If they could cut the property tax, it's something to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, the, the thing that is intriguing to me about that, this was brought up by a fellow from Framingham, 
And the thing that is intriguing to me about it is that when I look at how the Chapter 70 funding is supposedly handed out, one of the criteria that is looked at is not only property tax value in the community, but also the wealth of the mm -hmm. community from an income standpoint. Right. But of course, they don't distribute based on income and we have no ability to uh, assess that at the moment. I think it's an interesting concept. So Something. it's a change in the way you think of um, you know, how, how you achieve funding. It's something worth exploring. It's a different option. Mm -hmm. You're not, not, not going to know unless you take a look at it, right? So support that. So should I yeah. push that? In the yeah, paper? let's see if you can get something worth talking about. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Set the motion to adjourn? Well, oh, I, the next oh. school committee meeting is on a Tuesday, and it's at the Batchelder School. Oh. It's the first presentation in one of our, our schools this okay. year. Okay. Want to keep us here a little Motion to adjourn. adjourn. <laughs> Can I have a second? second. If, if, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>